Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Grand Rounds. My name is Tom Farden, I'm chair for today. I'm going to start off by uh, talk, giving you an update on the Archie Mountain Challenge, which I've dropped into the parish notices a couple of times recently. But for those of you who don't know, the Archie Mountain Challenge is going on at the moment. Um, it started on Saturday of last week with a, a family walk up Ben Wyvis, and they've, uh, the team have gone up, I think now, 40 of the Archies. Uh, the Archies are the mountains in Scotland above 1,000 metres in elevation that have more than 100 metres of drop before the next one. So um, they are the metric Munros, I suppose. Um, and the, uh, the intrepid team of mainly doctors and their families uh, set off on Dingwall with a, di a toe dip in the North Sea last Saturday and they're now somewhere about here-ish having completed about the first third. Uh, we're going to try and do this all in three weeks. So there'll be a bit of fell running, a bit of cy cyclocross and mountain biking, there's some road cycling and there's one bit where we have to kayak across a, a loch. Um, I was going to swim it but given the weather at the moment I think we'll stick to the kayak. So this is the route, uh, and it finishes in the rest of me thankful, uh, in hopefully in, three, in two weeks' time. Uh, if you want to be involved, it's, it's quite late notice, but if you do want to be involved, there is um, a family climb up Shahalian next Saturday, if you want to do that. Or if you just want to give to the charity, then uh, if you just go to archiesmountainchallenge.org.uk, there's a give, Just Giving page there. The other thing that we're doing is we're going to do a silly, crazy cycling challenge. This is me and my elder son cycling around on the cars. We're going to try to climb into space. So we're going to, we've picked one climb out on the Castle of Gary, and we're going to climb it as, um, as many times as we can in 12 hours to reach 100,000 metres of ascent. So that's 527 ascents uh, of this single climb uh, from 8 o'clock in the morning till 8 in the evening on the, th on the 14th of June. If you want to be involved, let me know. You can just Google it, and it pops up, and you can register for the, uh, for the, the hill climb. It's this climb, just going past Abba Knight. It's quite steep at the bottom, but it's all good fun. Um, and there's the Just Giving page if you'd rather give it a bit of money. We're grateful for anyone doing it, even one ascent, or you can come along and do, and do 30 or 40 if you really want to. So on to the matter of the business in hand. Uh, John Dick is going to speak to us on the enigmatic title of King of the Rainy Country. Now, in the, this day of digital uh, and internet everywhere, it's very difficult to digitally stalk John Dick because there's not much information on him. Um, so he's either a leather maker somewhere in Fife, or he's a, a footballer who played for West Ham uh, in the 50s, uh, securing one cap for Scotland against England, where England won, or is this smiling man at the bottom. Who is John Dick? Very little is known of John Dick. Uh, this is him and his guys uh, as, uh, as Munro. Uh, who, who obviously f uh, found the Munros. Um, but what I can tell you is that if you can find the man, he will always help you. Um, and it's just finding him is the struggle. So who is John Dick? Well, if you look up on Wikipedia, uh, the alma mater of Edinburgh University, it shows many famous and influential people such as Charles Darwin, Arthur Conan Doyle, uh, Erasmus Darwin, but does not show John Dick. So I have been into the Wikipedia page and I'm editing it as we speak, John. I, wait, I await approval. Um, John graduated from Edinburgh University and then went on to, uh, to work in very disparate fields, including renal and transplant medicine and, uh, fairly uniquely, uh, in chemical pathology. He then came to Ninewells Hospital, uh, where he has built a small empire in vascular medicine um, and scribbles in the notes in what looks like, at first hand to be incredibly neat handwriting that nobody can read. <laughs> Uh, I, I asked Colin Baines uh, what, uh, what would most exemplify John's time here with the junior doctors, um, and wine tasting seems to be the thing that came up most frequently. Um, where he's, I'm told, Colin says that he's almost as passionate about getting the junior doctors into wine as he is about medicine itself. Uh, this represents the hordes of patients who are waiting outside to see John in the vascular clinic and find out that he's on the ward and they will not be able to see him today uh, and will have to slum it with either Colin or Professor Belch. Um, he tells me he's an expert skier um, and these are a couple of the family photos I found on the internet from John while skiing. 
Uh, it's a little harsh. He did injure his shoulder last year, but uh, I believe he's back on the skis. But who John Dick really is, is the smiling Gregory House. I think that most of us who've worked here for any length of time know that if you've got a tricky case, you don't really know what you're doing, you want a, a valuable second opinion, he's the first door that you knock on. Or perhaps he's this man. This is John McClintock Dick, who was born in 1790 and was a judge and a man of high repute and was, uh, was revered by his community, by his peers and his friends. And moving swiftly from that, John Dick will talk to us, his friends, his peers, and we will listen with great reverence. Thank you, John. <laughs> I did remember to keep this switched off when I was talking outside so none of you knew what I really thought about all of this. Um, King of the Rainy Country, I'm not going to tell you what that is until we're about halfway through. Anyway, so I was uh, a student in Edinburgh and I, I still regard it as my second home. And this is Stockbridge, which is uh, near where we have our flat. Beautiful part of the world. Beautiful part of the world. Uh, and just round the corner is this, um, which is no relation, I might add. Um, and it's a lovely little um, wee shop uh, with all sorts of interesting trinkets and fashion. But my wife informs me that it's about 100% more than it should be, so go and have a look, but don't buy anything. And round the corner from that is the pantry, which is a restaurant. They've just started to do breakfasts. And uh, <coughs> they're nice people, but they are a bit serious, so... Um, they put up a sign saying breakfast at any time. <laughs> so I couldn't resist the old Stephen Wright joke and I went in and said I'd like French toast at the time to be the food. <laughs> <laughs> and that got me thinking about time and about time here and stuff that's changed. So, <clears throat> this is Apollo 13, seventh Apollo mission. I was 16 when this took off. Third intended moon landing. Of course, it didn't get there, as I'm sure a lot of you know. This is what happened. The cryogenic oxygen tank blew up here. Such a big bang that they thought they'd had a meteorite strike. That lost them power and oxygen for the main command module. <coughs> They reversed and put the lunar module, the landing module, on the nose and they used the lunar module as a lifeboat and used its power and support systems, including CO2 scrubbers, to keep them alive. They lassoed around the moon, but didn't land, clearly, and came back along this way here. Uh, they disengaged here, um, undocked from the lunar module there, which then burnt up, and got in, and their um, entry interface was 14 minutes when it should have been 8, so nobody knew that they'd made it. But they had. But they had. Wonderful. And that's what happened. That's a picture from the disengaged module, the camera facing backwards, of half the thing's been blown away. So why am I showing you that? Why am I showing you that? How did they do it? How did they do it? This is how they did it. An Apollo guidance computer. Okay, this was state of the art in 1970. It's a big bloody thing, 70 pounds, two feet by a foot, processor speed one megahertz, <laughs> four kilobytes of memory, seven segment numeric. Okay, cost $150,000 at 1970 prices. Okay, wow. And they did a fantastic job. One of the guys who was involved in this described it as um, you have a football, and they meant a soccer ball, and a tennis ball about 20 feet apart. And about six feet from the uh, soccer ball, you're flying back in, and you're aiming to sheet, hit a sheet of A4 paper, held end on. That was their target. And this is an iPhone 5S. I put this up for Alex Stoney, although he's got a 6 now. <laughs> Four ounces in weight. Tiny thing. 1.3 gigahertz of dual-core processor. 64 gigabytes of memory. Okay. Costs $400. 
That is more computing power than NASA had available to them in the whole organization to bring back Apollo 13. It's amazing. This is Moore's law. This is how processing speed has doubled. The amount of, of um, circuits you can print on a chip has doubled every two years since 1970. It has become self-fulfilling because the, the industry uses it as their, as their planning standard. And this is another representation of the same, and this one's extended out here. So this is not to say that we will have electronic mice or even electronic humans, but it does show you that by 2025, another 10 years from now, if the law holds, we will have that level of computing power on a chip. Um, how are we getting on in biochemical <laughs> Well, slow start. <laughs> Anybody know who this is or what that is? No? Okay, too embarrassed to say. It's digoxin. So that's William Withering. Okay. 1741 to 1799, he isolated digoxin from a herbal concoction used to treat the dropsy, which is heart failure and uncontrolled AF, um, an account of the foxglove. Okay. And he wrote underneath, time will fix the real value upon this discovery. Move forward a couple of centuries and we come more local as well, and now we're getting a bit more scientific. This is James Black of Dundee fame. And these are two molecules that he discovered. The first one is propranolol, and the second one is cymetidine. They're small molecules. Black's genius was the purposeful construction of drugs to investigate their effects on receptors. He didn't isolate receptors, but he knew what their molecules that interacted with them looked like and he tweaked the chemistry. He produced propranolol which was the first practical beta blocker for ICI. He told ICI that he had another one and they said we're not interested. So he left and went to Smithkind Bleaching instead. So they got cymetidine. One imagines that somebody in ICI got the jotters for that decision but we don't really know. And these were the first two blockbuster drugs. Anybody know what this is? Maybe not. This is captopril. And that's a different schematic of it binding to the receptor, the active site rather, of angiotensin converting enzyme. It's actually drosophila ace, but it's highly conserved. So now we're getting to ligand based drug design. Okay. These guys. Ferrer, Ng, and Vane all collaborated. In fact, Ng was in Sir John Vane's lab. Um, conversion of angio 1 to angio 2 occurs in pulmonary circulation. Bradykinin disappears in the pulmonary circulation. Bradykinin potentiating factor inhibits angio 1 to angio 2. Ferreira kept very tight lipped about what was in his BPF, but eventually he'd let, he'd let everybody know it was a peptide venom from the venom of the lancehead viper from South America. Okay. These guys then isolated the activity in BPF for ACE at the terminal sulfhydryl group, and a couple of years later, they patented captopril, the first working ACE inhibitor. Not a very good one, as it happens, short half-life, three times a day, and a terrible metallic taste in your mouth from the sulfur group, but there we are. Now, getting closer to my home now. This is mevastatin, the first statin. That's a torvastatin, and that doesn't project very well, but that is the stick model of a torvastatin in the active site of HMG-CoA reductase. So now we're talking about intelligent screening rather than intelligent drug design. This chap, Akira Endo, who's still alive and still researching, Built on the fact that cholesterol is mostly synthesized in the liver and the HM-CoA reductase is the rate-limiting step. Mevalonate, also in this, is a precursor for several essential compounds in cell wall structure. But it isn't in fungi. So he reasoned that fungi might have a blocking, in, uh, blocking compound as defense against bacterial attack. Smart guy. Took him five years, 
and he found mevastatin, which is a very powerful um, uh, reductase uh, blocker, but it causes tumours in dogs, so um, it didn't make it into the clinical field. First one out was lovastatin, and again, look at the lag time now, which is expanding, 1978, but didn't get out until 1987, and Simba, 1980, marketed 88. And by 2005, statin sales globally were $25 billion. So that's intelligent screening. This one, you'll never guess, but it's erythropoietin. And this is intelligent synthesis. These guys came up with hormones regulate the production of red cells by cross um, by cross transfusing rabbits. They called it hematopoietin, but uh, these other two researchers renamed it because it is just the red sign, cells erythrocytes. Goldwasser and King took nine years to purify about five milligrams of EPO from the urine of anemic sheep, rabbits. It's cheap, I think. <laughs> 95% pure, but once they got it, they were then able to give it to NIH and give it to Columbia, and they produce a partial amino acid sequence. That was enough to identify the gene and to start synthesis. An early EPO was made in Chinese hamster ovary cells because it's very heavily glycosylated. Clinical, style, uh, sorry, clinical trials from Eschbach, who was a nephrologist, and then isolation of EPO from a phage library and then industrial production. Still smallish molecules, but we're now talking about intelligent synthesis. And then this one, which is uh, rheumatoid hands, and it's interesting that uh, I think if I come back in 20 years and show that slide to the students, they'll be going, what is that? Tom and his colleagues tell me that uh, these drugs are going to abolish this kind of uh, deforming arthritis. So intelligent research, looking at anti-TNF, anti tuber necrosis factor research, a lot of that happened in the 80s in sepsis and didn't really help. In fact, it killed people. But Coleus in Athens developed a model of chronic polyarteritis and transgenic animal model. He reasoned that you should be looking at um, deregulated TNF production, not a sepsis model. And when he gave these animals anti-human TNF, he abolished their arthritis. Didn't take long because these drugs already had a research pedigree to get them into clinical trials. Colias also came over, up with the overlap between inflammatory bowel disease and polyarthritis, particularly Crohn's arthritis. And these are mesenchymal cells, which are a natural target for TNF. They drive the chronic inflammatory and destructive disease processes. So these anti TNF drugs are also used in inflammatory bowel disease and probably more to come. So that's intelligent research. Where we are now is in the threshold of our equivalent of Moore's Law. We're on the threshold of an explosion. This is the cost per genome. We've actually plopped it out from 2001 in this NIH slide. So in 2001, 14 years ago, it would have cost $100 million to sequence a genome. Technology improved in parallel with, with the Moore's Law prediction until 2007-2008 when automated chip plates came in and suddenly the cost drops like a stone. Okay? And last year, if you wanted to type your whole genome, it would cost you $8,000. This is our equivalent of that explosion in computing power and exactly the same cost per raw megabase. So this is one that's right up my street, actually. This is PCSK9. PCSK9 is pro-protein convertase subtilizing kexin type 9, and I've practiced a long time to be able to rip that on. It's an endoplasmic reticulum zymogen, cleavage enzyme, and it binds to LDL receptors using the EGFA repeat domain. That degrades LDL receptors. <coughs> what happens when LDL receptors bind to LDL 
is that they're internalised into the cell in a vacuole. That then binds to endoplasmic reticulum. If the bit of ER that it binds to does not contain PCSK9, the LDL is metabolised, but the receptor is recycled. If it does contain PCSK9, it destroys the LDL receptor. So, a very rare form of familial hypercholesterolemia is a gain of function mutation in PCSK9. You destroy more LDL receptors, you have less available, your cholesterol goes up. So from that, would inhibitors of PCSK9 lower cholesterol? And it turns out that they do. At the moment, there are three monoclonal antibodies in uh, near finishing t- t- uh, clinical trials, Amgen, Pfizer, and Aventis. There's also an RNA inhibitor, an antisense inhibitor, which at the moment just has a code name, a uh, code number. It doesn't have a, a name. And these are very powerful drugs. They are injectables once or twice uh, every two weeks. Um, they need to be kept in the fridge. They will not be cheap. But in patients who have familial hypercholesterolemia or who have very high cholesterol and are statin-resistant or statin-intolerant, this is the coming thing. So what does all that amount to? Well, what I'm trying to say here is that I've lived through an era of small molecules in pharmacy and pharmacology. And you won't, or you will, because you'll still be using deduction. But, <laughs> but your future is genetic. The future is tailored therapy. And just one or two thoughts about that there, preconception screening. Screening for individual genomes, not impossible. Different diagnostics, new targets, different inflammatory pathways, tumour growth and development, sunitinib, other things. And single gene illnesses, cystic fibrosis, Huntington's, FH, etc., What will happen during your working life is that you'll have a patient come in, you don't know what's wrong with them, and you'll get their genome done. And you'll isolate the bit you're interested in. And you'll say, yes, this breast cancer has this, that, and the next thing. No, you've got CF that's type 3 or whatever it is. You will see that. Fascinating. Bridge to the future stuff. And I'm jealous. Okay, so that's the first bit, and the second bit is uh, the king of the rainy country. And what I'm going to do now is talk about the NHS. I am like the king of a rainy country, rich but impotent, young and yet very old. Baudelaire was, of course, a manic depressive. Um, and an alcoholic, and he died of TB. Um, <clears throat> so it's not a very uplifting poem. It's the first two lines from his poem called Spleen. The French word is actually empuissant, which can be translated as powerless, which I prefer. <laughs> but it's normally, <laughs> it's normally rendered as impotent. This is the NHS. State in Scotland had a big health role in healthcare before 1948. Okay, we had the Highlands and Islands Medical Service, which had been going since 1913. It was state-funded, run from Edinburgh, and it ran the whole of medicine in the Highlands and Islands. During World War II, there was also a state-funded <coughs> hospital building process, and Scotland had its own distinctive medical tradition: medical schools rather than private practice. And it even had the Cathcart Report, which was a template for how things should go forward. And Euron Bevan is credited with um, building the NHS. And he was a man of vision. I'm not trying to detract from that. But what he did was he nationalised existing provisions. He didn't build anything from the ground up. And in Scotland, all this took was an act of parliament because everything else was already there. So how are we doing? This is the WHO's Health Systems in Transition series, and this is UK, and this, is, uh, and this one's Scotland. And this is 2012. 
a bit of uh, preamble because the WHO is based in Geneva and they all think that we're a poor white English speaking third world country. Population of 5 million, mostly on the central belt. Population density is low elsewhere. Size of population has remained stable over the last 50 years, but the proportion over 65 has increased and will increase further. I put this slide up now, and I'll just a health warning about it. I've copied that directly out of, the, um, out of the document, and I noticed last night that the scale is wrong. Um, this, is, <laughs> this is the 75-year-olds over at this end. They're not the 0 to 15s. They've reversed that. Um, anyway, sorry about that. So that's the young people, and this is the old people at this end. So, health system review. 10% of the UK economy. Service sector plus some oil and gas. Our GVA per head is 3% lower than the UK average. Okay. GVA is like GDP plus your subsidies minus your taxes. So we're less efficient than the rest of the UK. Public spending per head is 21% higher. We spend more on public services. And that's entirely in the remit of the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government. We spend more than England and uh, the UK average. 2072, events is 1926, and that's the 2012 data. Okay. Since 2000, doubled in cash terms, 40% increase in real terms. It accounts for 10% of our GDP and about 34-35% of the Scottish Government budget. In 2012, they said the predicted spending to 2015 is locked in. However, uh, you will know, efficiency and productivity savings of at least 3% a year. Financial balance in the face of inflationary, demographic and clinical pressures. Good luck. Are we significantly different? A little bit. We do spend a bit more, although Northern Ireland's just sprinted up. This is, a, this is our total health spend. And there's UK. And this is my uh, slide. NHS Scotland Act 1947, administrative seven separately in, in 1948, ministerial oversight from the Scottish Office before devolution. 1314 operating budget is £12 billion. 11.1 of that goes directly to the health boards. And in 1314, that was 35% of the Scottish Government's budget. We have 67,000 nurses, 11,000 AHPs, 4,800 GPs, etc., etc., and about 16, sorry, 160,000 staff in total. This is physicians, all medics, not GPs versus hospital. EU has more, but it has fewer nurses. They have a doctor-heavy system. There's the United Kingdom, there's Scotland. Slightly more, not a lot. And this is nurses. I mentioned about the EU. There's Scotland pretty much in line with the UK total. Life expectancy is improved, but is still below the rest of the UK or Western Europe. Circulatory disease, neoplasm, chronic respiratory disease. Significant inequalities in health linked to smoking, alcohol, poor diet, which are all debt cap related. And the conclusions from the HDI, what have we done well? Substantial increase in funding, workforce, marked improvements in population health, increasing divergence from England, both in health policy and in health systems. Key challenges though, closing the gap still got a gap. Reducing health inequalities for those in debt cap 6-7. Sustaining what we've built on despite the fact that we're running out of money. The challenge for those involved in government and the NHS is to demonstrate that the distinctive Scottish approach is delivering results at least on a par with those in other systems and to articulate it convincingly as an alternative to market-driven approaches, which is what happens 
in England. So this is the Scottish Government's response. 2020 vision. don't know if any of you have read it. A few of you I know have just had consultant interviews, so I imagine you can recite the whole thing chapter and verse. But here is the mission statement. I don't like the phrase mission statement, but here it is. Our vision for healthcare in Scotland is that by 2020, everyone is able to live a longer, healthier, etc. <coughs> Integrated health and social care. Prevention, anticipation, supported self-management. If we have to get you into hospital, we'll try and do it as a day case. Care will be provided the highest standards of quality, safety, person-centred. And try and get people back into home or a home-like environment as fast as possible. So this is the Nuffield Health Foundation comparing our four health systems. We have commonality, tax-funded service, universal coverage, similar values, similar operating principles, comprehensive benefits. But we've diverged. All four home countries have diverged. <coughs> have these different approaches made any difference? Are there any lessons that we can transmit across the boundaries? And in this, they used northeast region of England as a comparator for Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. There's no perfect comparator, but that was the best region. Okay? In Northeast, they have improved life expectancy and mortality. In 1990, it was very similar to Scotland. By 2010, the rates of mortality were 15 to 19 percent higher in Scotland. And by uh, 2011, 20 years later, in the Northeast, they bought themselves an average of one extra life year. They did that by increasing their spend, but they still don't spend as much as Scotland does. And one of the ways of looking at this is this concept of amenable mortality. Premature death from a cause that should not occur in the presence of a timely and effective healthcare system. Whether that's a diabetic, or a missed appendicitis, or a young ruptured aneurysm, whatever. Other mortality is death from other causes. Between 1990 and 2010, our amenable mortality has halved, more than halved. Okay? And twice the rates have declined for other mortality. So we're actually doing something right. These are the trends. Four comes to the UK and northeast England. Okay, northeast is this open circle, turquoise line. Good progress, but the blue line at the top is Scotland. Same with this one. Blue line at the top is Scotland. More worryingly, and not amenable to health spend, or maybe amenable to social care spend. This is the mortality from other causes, 0 to 64. Women were worse than the rest. Men were a lot worse than the rest. Dramatically so. And this is amenable mortality in 65 to 74. Again, dramatic improvement, but again, we're still along the top, and women the same. And all-cause mortality... 65 to 74, that's the step change in the northeast region there, leaving us once again in pole position. And this rather complex table, life expectancy, mortality, and relative health care need. Don't worry too much about that. Just look at amenable mortality here. Okay, 97, this is 0 to 75, so this is <coughs> the two curves put together, if you like. 97 for men. 77 for women, and we are the worst by quite a large statistically significant number. Okay, and if you look at other mortality age under 75, again, we are the worst. England's lowest, Scotland's the highest. Okay, I've just given you those numbers there. 
Decline in mortality was 10% greater for both sexes in North East England, despite the fact they're still not as spending as much as we do. And again, I've given you the data at the bottom already. This is an interesting comparator also from the same um, paper. And it's interesting because it's UK NHS 2000. It's also Kaiser Permanente. Anybody know about that or worked in the States or anything? No? Okay. So Kaiser Permanente is a non-profit making um, insurance organisation in the States that does global cover. So it does primary care and secondary care and hospitals, etc., etc. Kaiser Permanente will reduce your health insurance um, if you stop smoking. They are very aware of global health management and of preventing disease rather than just treating it. Now, okay, it's in their interest to reduce the amount of time you spend in the hospital, but there is a comparator from 2000, okay? Mean length of stay, inpatient admissions per 100,000, per thousand rather, and acute bed days per 1,000. Even comparing us with UK uh, 2000, though, we've, we've made improvements. But we still put a lot of people in hospital, not as many as the Welsh do, but quite a lot. Okay? Our average stay is the second worst, again, compared to the Welsh. And our inpatient admissions has improved, although the Welsh are slightly worse. So, main conclusions. Okay. The different policies adopted by each country are paid to have made little difference to long-term national trends. You can see marginal differences, but this lack of difference is surprising given the extent of the debate, the public debate, about differences in structure, purchaser provider split, patient choice, etc., etc. And we are laboring under this tortoise school of management. And this is the Auditor General. How are we doing? How did we do? Okay. Well, we met targets in 1314, but we're having difficulty doing it. We get given two financial targets, break even against both revenue and capital budgets. You can't carry a deficit, or you're not supposed to. There is some brokerage on that. This is the Auditor General for Scotland. The requirement for NHS boards to break even makes it more difficult to carry out longer-term financial planning, difficult for boards to balance the funding of services to meet current needs with the investment required to address longer-term issues. Okay. We recommend that the Scottish Government should consider moving away from setting annual financial resource limits to help people plan for longer term. Okay. There is some brokerage, okay, but it's annually adjustable. The Scottish Government set out an ambitious vision, 2020. It will be challenging to make these changes, critical if to meet the vision. Progress is slow, more significant change, more care in the community. We will not be able to provide services like this. Change on the scale will be challenging at the same time as we're trying to meet demanding targets for hospital care and when budgets are getting more hard. Okay. We missed some waiting time targets. The focus on waiting time targets may not be suitable when we're looking at these. There's evidence of pinch points in the complex health and social care system, okay. otherwise known as Edison. NHS boards need a more detailed understanding of current and future patient demand, how they're using their capacity, how patient moves through the system, how they can deliver services differently. Hmm. And that would be funny, except it's not funny at all. This is how the Germans do it. We think of the NHS as being the oldest national health system in the world. It isn't the Germans, is it? Okay. Otto von Bismarck, the Iron Chancellor. Health Insurance Bill of 83, Accident Insurance Bill of 84, Old Age and Disability Insurance Bill of 89. And they still operate on that basis. 
be very clear, I'm not suggesting that we go for a health insurance system. But health insurance is compulsory for the whole population. There are 130 of these public non-profit sickness funds. It's run at federal state level. It's paid for by joint employer-employee contributions. Provider payment is negotiated. Sickness funds can't refuse membership and can't use demographics or, or um, uh, actuarial tables to, to manipulate things. And municipalities pay for social welfare benefit holders, so everybody has a plan. Here are their three key points, which we share, or should do. Solidarity. Government takes responsibility for ensuring universal access, but we have no quibble with that. Subsidiarity. A decentralised system. Policy is implemented by the smallest feasible political and administrative units in society. Gosh, wouldn't you just love that? And corporatism. Democratically elected representation on the governing boards, including politicians, patients and employees. In theory, we have that. In practice, we don't give it enough teeth. And lastly, not part of Bismarck's three, but still there, it's regulated by a federal joint committee. That's a public health organisation. It's not a government organisation. It's technocratic and it's apolitical. So we've been to the polls twice recently. And I've been irritated by the talks about the NHS in both times. Irritated by an egregious twerp on the television saying that the only way of protecting the NHS in Scotland against Tory predations was to vote for independence. Complete nonsense. It's fully devolved. We can do what we want with our health service. It's nothing to do with what happens in England. And irritated the second time, really irritated in the recent general election, when Nick Robinson on his um, BBC Update website said that um, David Cameron was going to have to make a, a serious policy speech about health service policy within the next week in order to neutralise Ed Miliband's attempts to weaponise the health service. Weaponise the health service. I nearly broke my laptop. <laughs> I got really mad at Robinson, and then I got mad at uh, Miliband, and then I got mad at everybody. <laughs> Apolitical. So what's a response to Vision 2020? Give us the money. Let us know what we need to spend for the next five years. Tell us now. Let us plan ahead. Give us the money. Then leave us alone. Technocratic. No political interference. Interim <coughs> reviews, yes, to see how we're getting on. But no stop net marks. Just let us do it. Collect the data. I haven't discussed this very much. But all these papers that are quoted, and another very good one from the King's Fund, discuss how our health service data in the four home countries is collected in a completely different manner and isn't comparable. We've set up an experiment of four different health services, and we can't find out what we're doing because we can't compare the data. But the first thing is, collect it. Fourth point, judge us by the results. Okay. And if it doesn't work, be honest about it. If Vision 2020 doesn't work, and the English system works better, then we owe it to the people of Scotland to change how we do it. I don't believe that will happen, but that's, that would be the answer. But if we're much better, then we need to be saying to the English, guys, you've got it wrong. And lastly, it's called Vision 2020 for a reason. It'll take five years. It will take five years. No interim reviews. No change of plan halfway through. No reorganisation. Leave us alone. It'll take five years. And, of course, you may say, well, that's easy for you to say because you're not going to stick with it. <laughs> and I'm not. Um, I have actually <laughs> once met a guy who ejected from a plane, though not one of these, and I said, what's it like? And he said it nipped a bit, <laughs> but not as bad as sticking with it. <laughs> but one thing we have got right with 2020 is the emphasis on the workforce. Okay, you guys very important (sighs) 
it's going to be difficult to make this work and it will be crucially dependent on the workforce for it to happen okay but look around you in this room now although there are people leaving going um, this room has more intellectual firepower in it right now than sits in there okay and imagine this plus Glasgow Royal Glasgow Southern Edinburgh Royal Edinburgh Western and Aberdeen then add in Herr Myers uh, Borders General Kikoli, etc., etc. The biggest resource that they have to make this work isn't these <coughs> people in there. It's you guys. And you know, if intelligence, ingenuity, industry, and sheer bloody mindedness can make it work, then you guys can make it work. So, last few minutes, I'm going to talk a little bit, a bit about uh, my own thoughts about medicine. A quote from Hamlet. It's actually a quote from Polonius, who, <laughs> who didn't do too well, as you may remember, in, in Hamlet. <laughs> but uh, yeah, these few precepts in that memory, so you see that character. So here's a few precepts. Medicine is the last refuge of the polymath. I used to hear that a lot when I was a lad. I worry about this one because I think we're losing it. And we're losing it both in the more general and in the specific. <clears throat> we're immeasurably better now at selecting medical students than we were when I was a lad. But having graduated them at 22, 23, we're now homogenizing them. And that's understandable in some respects because if you're going to take a 23-year-old medical graduate and make them a fully-fledged GP in six years or a fully-fledged cardiac surgeon in ten years, there's a lot to learn, there's a lot to cram in, and they all have to do it pretty much the same way. What we're losing, though, if, with all of that is the ability to have significant interests outside of medicine. GPs accepted, I, I would, uh, and, and other people who are more committed, but there we are. And we're also losing the polymath within the narrower confine of, of, of medicine. We, don't ne we no longer have, well, <clears throat> we no longer have somebody who started out as an FY or a PRHO in Edinburgh and then did a, C a CCUSHO job and then did an anaesthetic SHO job and then did a respiratory reg job and then did an emergency medicine job then did some orthopaedics and went back to emergency medicine and then became the head of the emergency department in St. James's Hospital in Leeds. And that's my friend Alistair McGowan, who then became postgraduate dean in Glasgow. He could not train like that. We have lost the ability to train across the grain. We need to re try and rediscover that. This one's Gandhi. And you really can't better that, can you? In a teaching hospital? Fantastic. Next one is Voltaire. <clears throat> Doubt is not a pleasant condition, but certainty is absurd. This is medicine. It's not physics, it's not engineering, it's not mathematics, it's not join the dots. Remember that something can always happen. And if it can happen, it probably will. Maya Angelou, building on the thing about lifetime learning. And last one's John Maynard Keynes, who was an economist. When the facts change, so I change my mind. What do you do? <laughs> and uh, he said that to an MP. Um, <laughs> and remember that your evidence base is an evolving um, topic. I spent five years of my life giving ladies eight, um, estrogen postmenopausally because I knew it raised HDL. And then we realised it caused breast cancer and I stopped doing that. Two or three lighter ones. I've, I've, that's off the internet. I used to have that button. I can't find it anywhere. It's actually the, uh, it's, it's the title line from a, a Richter cartoon. So. <laughs> Voltaire again.
and Andrew Doig. Physician in Edinburgh. Um, <clears throat> my dad used to say that as well. Um, and uh, I wouldn't be quite so absolutist about that. But I think it's a very useful yardstick. Um, yeah. <coughs> The, other, the flip side of that, of course, is if you've got a sense of humour, you can actually have a lot of fun in medicine. It, it's been irritating and frustrating and sometimes sad. But it's also been challenging, stimulating, blah, blah, blah. But it's been fun. I've had fun. I hope you all have fun. Oops. Back one. Um, that's my family. I was... Uh, very impressed that Philip Cahir had a, a team photograph of his family when he retired. <coughs> and uh, we don't normally take team photographs, so that's my son's graduation. And I'm sorry, it's a rather poor quality picture. It was his girlfriend's iPhone. Um, <coughs> and that's my son Gordon, who, if you need a sense of humour to be a good doctor, he's already on, on his way to being a very good doctor indeed. It's my son John, who's an economist with Eon, and my hope for his future is that he earns enough money to keep me in the manner to which he's become accustomed. And my wife Maureen. So, two things you take from that picture. The first is that I'm the one with, by far and away, the least head hair in that picture. And the second is that... Um, Although I'm not a small man, or I don't think of myself as a small man, when Maureen has her high heels on, I'm the smallest in the family. Um, and those two facts alone have been used to keep me grounded <laughs> over the years. And I'm going to Australia. And that's Ningaloo. I'm not going to Australia to lie on the beach, although I probably will do some beach lying. I'm actually going to work. Um, if the, if the Australian College of Physicians think I'm a decent chap, which I'm still waiting to hear. Um, so I'm going to do some admin, and I'm going to be a physician. And I've got one or two research ideas that I'm still kicking around. And people have said, will you come back? Well, my wife's a Castle Gary girl, and I think of myself as an Edinburgh man. And that's St Stephen's Church at the top of Stockbridge. And here's one I made earlier. It's an engraving from 1810. And round the corner, there's a wee muse. And in the muse, there's a plaque. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks very much, John. I think it uh, demonstrates how much affection the hospital and the university has for you by the turnout and, and that people are only just now leaving when it's me talking. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't uh, propose to throw uh, open for questions, but um, I, uh, I'd just like to send, uh, give you my personal thanks for the, uh, the difference you've made to my career. Uh, you gave me my first registrar job here in Perth in 2004, and I suspect there's nobody really in this room whose life you haven't touched in a positive way. And uh, so on behalf of everyone in the room, everyone in NHS Tayside and the University of Dundee Medical School, I'd just like to thank you for all the work you've done, and you will be sorely missed. Thanks. Thanks very much. Right, get to clinic. <laughs> Thanks so much, everyone. Uh, same time, same place next week. I'll send out an email with details. Thank you. <laughs>